My name is Audrey Durfee. I'm the Aquatics Manager at the Cottonwood Heights Rec Center. I am also the Committee Chair for the Utah Drowning Prevention Coalition. And I'm Mikkel Christensen. I am the uh, Public Relations uh, Chair, I guess, for the Drowning Prevention Coalition. And we're super excited to be here today. So thanks for inviting us, everybody. So a lot of you might not know that the Utah Drowning Prevention Coalition existed. We started as a group of aquatic professional, professionals. We meet every month, and after one of the meetings in 2019, we were like, what can we do to help promote water safety, not only at our facilities, but statewide? So the coalition was formed. We fall under the Utah Recreation and Parks Association. We're a subcommittee of them, and we're really stoked to have them as kind of our governing, I don't know, governing agency. But yeah. currently we're collaborating with the National Guard Auxiliary, State Parks, Utah Vital Statistics, the Division of Outdoor Recreation, Safe Kids Utah, and other local agencies. We hosted our very first annual stakeholder retreat about a year ago, and we're gonna do another one in October. You can find us online. We have a web, well, we have a web page on the, the URPA website, and then we also have a Facebook page that has a lot of our content and videos and things that we post. So you can find us there. Um, so when we started, one of the things that we knew were the national statistics we knew that 11 people drown every day and we knew that it was the leading cause of death in children between the ages of one and four or accidental death what we did not know was our our local stats and we were encouraged as a newly founded coalition to attend the national drowning prevention um oh what are they the ndpa conference and one of the presenters there asked who is drowning in your state and I had no idea, none of us knew. And I, I didn't even know where to find that information, but we reached out to Utah Vital Stats and one of their staffers sent us the statistics from 2017 to 2021. We had very little information. We didn't know what the cause of the drowning was, whether it was, you know, for the children, if it was like a backdoor swimming pool, a bathtub, or if it was what kind of body of water it was. But what we were shocked by was that if you look at 2021, that out of the 47 deaths, 33 of them were adults. And so here we were as a coalition, totally prepared to run a campaign to like promote water safety, you know, for children. And how do we get these kids to be safer in around water? And what we found was it's the adults that also needed the education. So we took those statistics. And in 2021, we also got statistics from Ty Hunter, who's over... Um, this, the boating for state parks. And there were 10 fatal drownings in our Utah lakes between March and August of last year. Last summer, in one week, we had five drownings and a life jacket could have saved, you know, or could have um, prevented those drownings. And so knowing those statistics, we decided to move forward. <clears throat> and one of the things that we were looking at is what contributed to these drownings in Utah, and a big one was not wearing life jackets. That was huge, right? We make our kids wear life jackets, but as adults, we think, ah, I'm a good enough swimmer, I don't need to, or I'm not gonna, I'm not even gonna get in the water. So we, we don't wear a life jacket. We don't consider the temperature of the water, right? We overestimate the, or we underestimate the conditions. So cold water, the wind, and how quick it can pick up on our lakes. We overestimate our abilities, just like it says right there, and underestimate the elements of nature. And then we also want to help people. There were so many tragedies on bodies of water in our state where it was someone that was struggling and someone else wanted to help them. And so they also went in and then they ended up drowning as well. And so these are the things that kind of contribute to drowning. And these were the things that we really wanted to talk about to the public. So we decided what our focus was going to be and kind of what our hedgehog was. And what we came up with were three things. The first thing was life jackets. We knew we needed to talk about life jackets for everybody. And so one of the things we did this year is we decided to host some lake visits. So we went to Jordanelle and we went to Deer Creek and we set up a booth and we had on the previous slide those little pictures, those cards. We printed those cards and we were passing them out 
to people that were just hanging out on the beach and families and talking to them about water safety. Um, every Wednesday during the month of May, in honor of National Water Safety Month, we do Water Wednesdays. It's a social media campaign to promote water safety, and specifically this year, we um, during like the last month of May, it's National Boating Safety Week, and so they have a National Wear Your Life Jacket at Work Day. So we participated in that. We host an annual garf, uh, a gol garf, a golf tournament, talking's hard, an annual golf tournament fundraiser to raise money to help us, you know, we've talked about like fun, helping fund life jacket loaner stations, things like that. And another thing going back to um, the life jackets is we worked with the associate the associate director of operations for the division of outdoor recreation and we had the lieutenant governor do a psa it was that same week when we did the national wear your life jacket at, at work day so life jackets were our number one number two was swim lessons because we know that 88 percent of children who have formal swim lessons are less likely to drown than those who don't so we know if we can teach kids to learn how to swim, they can be safer around water. So we want to promote swim lessons across the state. And in the works, we have a, we're working on a statewide swim lesson database. So wherever you live, anybody can go and look in their area and see who offers swim lessons and what's available for them and their family, for adults and children, not just for little kiddos. And then our third thing is kind of an outreach focus that's kind of ch that could change depending on the statistics one of the statistics that we learned early on was we we couldn't believe but it was um that 106 or children with autism are 160 times more likely to drown than <clears throat> compared to the general pediatric population and so this year we wanted to focus on children with autism and so what we did is we hosted a training for swim instructors that could come and they could learn what to teach and how to teach so that those children could also learn how to be safer around the water. And then we also did, we, uh, do you want to move to the next yep, slide? Yep, I'll move to the next one. <laughs> Yay! So there, those are some pictures of our, we got Unified Fire to pose in their life jackets and then one of our directors, so that was a really fun day. And then if you want to play, this is the PSA that the Lieutenant Hi, Governor did. <clears throat> Audrey, I have a question for you. Please. So I work with primary children in trauma outreach. And I think one of my biggest questions is what can um, nurses, what can like involved community members or concerned community members do to decrease the drowning in our state? So <clears throat> that's a question that I think can have a lot of different answers. One of the things that we talked about as like medical providers so I went to the pediatrician's office with one of my kiddos in the summer, right? It was like, I guess, right before summer. And in the handout they gave me, it was like, hey, be careful around water. And I was like, hey, that's cool. Can we, can I bring some information here? Is there something that, you know, that you would pass out to your, your patients? And he said, absolutely. And then we started talking yesterday, like it, it can be small things. Maybe it's in the month of May, offices and this is what we don't know we're still a really new coalition and we're just starting to feel like we're making some progress and so we want to make all the connections that we can and go to events and be a part of it but as far as like the medical field is concerned like we were like maybe because they show videos in you know offices like could we show water safety videos during the month of may instead of a disney movie or something like that or can we put water watcher cards in the offices or can you know if there's something on your website if you can promote water safety link to ours or just like all work together to talk about it and what are the basic things parents can do like don't take your eyes off your kiddos right nine out of ten drownings happen when a caregiver is present but not paying attention and so i think if we're just like don't take your eyes off those kids and just as adults making sure that you wear a life jacket. So just like the small things, we remind people to wear a, a seat belt. Can we remind them to wear a life jacket anytime they're near water? I don't know. I don't know if that's a question. There's a lot of things. Okay. I think we're back up and running. Can everybody see the PowerPoint now? 
Oh, sorry. I don't know. I don't know if we're supposed to be looking at the chat, but um, the stat for those who have taken swim lessons, they are 88% less likely to drown than those who haven't had formal swim lessons. And the part of that that's really important to remember is it's not even that they have learned to swim at swim lessons. It's just the process of taking swim lessons and learning because at every swim lesson, the first thing they tell you is you have to wait for someone to get in the water, right? And so some of those basic water safety things that they learn at swim lessons also contributes to that. So, okay, I guess it's my turn now. Thanks, Audrey. Um, my part of the presentation, I'm just gonna go over really quickly kind of our background. Um, obviously, Audrey and I are more on the lifeguard pre-hospitalization side of this. Um, and we've been really surprised about just things that people don't know about the drowning process. So we're gonna go over just a little bit of that um, that might happen before they reach you guys um, at a hospital or somewhere like that. So um, when we teach about drowning to lifeguards and parents, we teach the drowning chain of survival. Um, and we focus 90% of that effort on the prevention piece, that little green circle with the life jacket. So just being safe around the water, wearing a life jacket, having a water watcher, um, that's what we focus a lot on. And then um, the orange or the yellow and the red parts uh, are what we work on with more lifeguards. And that's recognizing people in distress, providing flotation, uh, removing them from the water, and then providing care as needed. Um, but before 2002, there were 33 different definitions of drowning. Um, you've probably heard a lot of them, but we're trying to remove those because drowning is just a process. Um, it starts at submersion and the inability to breathe and then ends with death and then various levels of morbidity. Um, so we're trying to remove terms like dry, wet, active, passive, secondary, um, and especially near drowning. There's nothing near about drowning. It's just a process and how far the process goes. Um, there's only two types. So we refer to them as fatal drownings and non-fatal drownings. Um, fatal drownings result in death immediately following or shortly after. Um, dry drowning is just not a reality. There's always water involved. Um, and then fatal drowning, non-fatal drowning can have a range of outcomes. So permanent med medical conditions, brain damage, and things like that, or it can result in the full return to health, which is the best case scenario and very fortunate, um, but typically not the case. There's usually some lingering effects from drowning. Um, and then just a little bit about uh, the physiology of drowning. It has little to do with water in the lungs. So initially when someone drowns, they hold their breath in that struggle. Um, and then as they attempt to inhale, they actually swallow a lot of water. Once they pass out, they have reflexive swallowing. So usually they have about um, just under 30 milliliters of water to no fluid in their lungs. Uh, even recovered bodies after they've been underwater for a significant amount of time that are, they re, they, um, decide have died from drowning. They only have one to two milliliters per kilogram of weight in their lungs. Um, well, the lack of oxygen leads to cardiac arrest. So this is a, a rare situation where an otherwise healthy child can be removed from the water and they're in cardiac arrest. Um, what the water does cause is a lot of foaming at the mouth. And so when you start the resuscitation process, we want to make sure we educate people that that's something they will see. Um, and it often results in vomiting. So the airway is always very difficult to maintain. You've got a wet, slippery body um, with foam, food, sand, vomit, uh, all blocking that airway. And so as lifeguards, that's something that we focus a lot of time on. Um, we had a trauma doctor. I don't know if anyone's heard of him, but he is the medical director for Starfish Aquatics. Um, his name's doc Dr. Justin Semsrot. He's in Idaho. Um, he came down and presented to us. And a couple of things that I really took away from his presentation were drowning is a brain issue with lung complications. The primary issue is that they are not getting oxygen to the brain. And then he goes on to say, much has been debated and discussed about what wet drowning, what is a dry drowning, what is a delayed drowning, what is a secondary drowning. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Their brain has been deprived of oxygen. They might as well have been in outer space. And now as a resuscitationist, we must interrupt that process and get oxygen to the brain. Because amongst the crowded discussion, people really enjoy debating. They have one problem, they're not getting oxygen to their brain. So, um, why all this matters is because they're in a hypoxic arrest. Um, and typically American Heart, Red Cross, all of the CPR guidelines, when you look at them are written to save a witnessed VTAC or VFib patient. They're not looking at patients who have no oxygen in their blood system. So when you do compressions, it circulates 25% of the oxygen that's existing in the blood versus someone who has drowned, their oxygen reduces to zero before they go into cardiac arrest. And so your compressions, if you're not doing breaths or airway, um, you're not circulating any oxygen. So just making sure that the airway 
and breaths and compressions go first. So if it's a drowning victim, they need to do ABCs in that order, not compression only CPR. So that's something that we're focusing on educating rescuers, uh, especially lifeguards about. Um, and then kind of just reverting back to what we're doing. So all the things we've talked about, our mission is just to prevent fatal and non-fatal drownings by empowering people in our community. Um, we wanna work together with people as a piece of the drowning prevention process. Um, and then work with medical medical professionals to gather better statistics. So um, just learning, like Audrey said, we didn't know for sure what we didn't know. And so as we move forward, that's something that we're working really closely on. Um, and just, yeah, that's kind of where we're going for, for the rest of the next year or so. And, and we're excited to go in that direction. So um, does anybody else have any questions for Audrey or I on the statistics or things like that about Utah? That's kind of what we were asked to cover. So hopefully that helps. Mikkel, we've got a question in the chat and Absolutely. I can read it to you. That'd um, be great. So Wendy is wondering if there are signs at all of the boat docks and swim beaches at the popular Utah lakes. And the signage would be something like encouraging people to wear life jackets or survival versus deaths without life jackets and statistics and things like that. Yeah, so that's something that the, oh, go ahead, Audrey. No, I was just gonna say one of the things when we were deciding how what kind of campaign we wanted to roll out about life jackets at our golf tournament we created these yard signs that had all of these statistics that people were shocked by and we wanted to post all of those yard signs leading up to the boat ramps or leading up to the you know where they pay whatever and then as we were talking to some of the state parks guys they were like people don't read signs <laughs> so we um, decided to go the route of the lake visits and do these visits, but we know that it would, I mean, it would be awesome to have stuff posted at the lake. Some of them have, I know Utah Lake has recently um, put up a few life jacket loaner stations that have statistics and have information and stuff like that, but we don't have near enough considering how many bodies of water we have in our state. So absolutely. That's a great idea. Maybe we can, you know, do something like that. But people don't read all the time like we'd like them to. I think the biggest impact has been those life jacket loaner stations because people will see them and the kids are like, oh, I want to use one of these. And they have some of the statistics and information on them. Um, the one at Utah Lake's awesome. It's got a little plaque that um, memorializes the two young women who lost their lives a couple years ago out there. And it's, it's a story that hits home for people and they remember. And so it's really nice to have something like that. Okay. Oh, that's awesome. Ali put in the chat that 100% fatalities, let's see, Kentucky had a sign that said 100% of fatalities were not wearing a life jacket. That's awesome. In Utah, we seem to have a lot of um, impact statistics from boating as well. So trauma related deaths along with our drowning deaths. So that's something that we'd love to distinguish between us as, as you guys work with those types of people, so. And Mikkel and Audrey, we've got a few more comments in the chat. Um, Janet says, thanks for your great work and the education you provide to lifeguards and our community. She's confident that you're saving lives, as am I. And uh, life jacket loaner stations are an excellent idea. And uh, Wendy also talking about uh, the state park guys and the signage wouldn't have to be complicated or overly wordy, um, like the seatbelts save lives phrase. And yeah. question, what if only one person did read the sign and it saved, yeah. saved a life? So for sure. Absolutely. Great points. We Wendy agree with Janet. you. We're not anti-sign. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, you guys. Yeah. Well, thank you both, Mikkel and Audrey, um, for all of that great insight. And next, we're going to hear from our primary children's colleagues, Carly and Lindy. So I'm going to turn the time over to you. Great. Thanks, um, Lindy. I'm going to go first, and then I'll have you follow. How's that sound? <laughs> awesome. So it's uh, nice to be here with you all. I'm Carly Kump. I am a community health program manager at Primary Children's Hospital. So my role is to keep kids out of the hospital. And how we do that is with education. So. I'm going to go through some talking points that maybe you'll learn from and maybe that you'll be able to share with those that you interact with, work with, um, any of those things in your professional and personal capacities. Um, one thing I'm going to show you, and I'll also put the 
the link in the chat. You can find this on our website and I'll share my screen in just a second. But um, it's our, our sign, it's our flyer that talks about being smart around water and water safety. Um, we have it in both English and Spanish and there's also a video on that link that um, you can access as well. So I'll, I'm just gonna share it while I talk. So you have something to look at and read because I did not create a PowerPoint. So you're seeing the Be Smart Around Water, correct? Yes. Awesome. Okay. So while you look at that, you feel free to download whatever, whatever you want. Um, we also have some printed. So if you reach out to me, I can mail some to you or get some to you as well. Um, but some of the things that have already been discussed, which are great, but uh, we'll just reiterate those and, and get them get them in there. But um, one thing about drowning and being safe around water is to remember that layers of protection help prevent drownings. And so as we've discussed, drowning is the leading cause of death in children and teens. And um, among young, ch young children, most of the drownings happen at home around pools and hot tubs. And in teens, those drownings take place more in like our oceans, lakes, and rivers. It happens quick, it's usually silent. And so that's why we wanna make sure we have layers of protection because you never know which layer will save a life. So one of the layers is assigning a water watcher, which has been talked about before. There should always be an adult water watcher while children are in or around any body of water. Um, the water watcher should be at least within an arm's length of young children and beginning swimmers. Um, for older children who are more comfortable swimming, who have had swim lessons, um, the water watcher that's designated should always just keep their eyes on the children um, and, and not, use, not being distracted. So, you know, they shouldn't be playing on their phone, um, immersed in conversation, uh, drinking alcohol, or doing anything else that may be a distraction. And at a party, having adults take turns as the water watcher, even if there's like a lifeguard on duty, um, can help be a layer of protection is just always having somebody designated to be a water watcher. Um, another layer of protection is using fences, alarms, and covers on all pools, even including above ground pools and hot tubs, is just making sure that there's some type of a fence, alarm, or cover, um, self-closing, locked gate, anything like that to add protection um, between that body of water and somebody who may get in there. Um, we talked about this before too, is having kids take swimming lessons um, and scheduling those swim lessons for at least when they're a year old as recommended by the AAP and in our comments on, um, on this Zoom. But swim lessons don't replace the need for a water watcher. Um, it just makes uh, drowning less likely. And one of the, the resources that you can reach out to, it's like our local rec centers for swim lessons. You, the Red Cross website has classes. Um, and looking at, at that, as well as um, if there are parents or families that are in need of reduced rate lessons, is asking about you know reduced rates um, and free lessons as well. And just like a plug out there too, if you don't know how to swim, even as an adult is to consider taking lessons as well. And then learning CPR, which has been discussed, everybody, every parent should know how and when to do CPR. Um, like we talked about, it brings blood to the heart, brain and other organs and starts breathing until um, somebody can come and give advanced life support. Using life jackets um, and this, you know, be the example here as well is um, if you're wearing one, other people are more likely to be wearing one as well. And they should be the Coast Guard approved life jackets. They're usually a stamp just on the inside of the jacket that says Coast Guard approved. Um, and you should wear them while you're on the boat, even if you can swim, even if the kids can swim, you should always have one on. Um, the life jackets aren't going to do any good if they're in the cabinet because they can't protect someone from drowning if you're suddenly thrown into the water. And just a reminder that water wings and other floaties um, don't protect children from drowning. Um, life jackets and floaties should be used along with, not instead of adult supervision. And then of course, no alcohol or drugs because this increases the risk of drowning while swimming or boating. And it, um, we really wanna encourage, you know, talking to teens about these risks as well. And again, setting that example. 
And then some other education pieces is encouraging people to check up on their own home safety, emptying all bathtubs, baby pools, and water buckets after use. Putting locks on bathroom doors and toilets um, are also things to consider when talking about water safety within the home. And then like I just mentioned before is talking to teens. Um, I mean, there are teens who are strong swimmers who are still at risk for drowning. So talking to teens about never swimming alone and um, wearing a life jacket, all of those other ways to stay safe in water. Um, so that's what I have for education wise, especially when you're just out in the community and sharing and talking with parents. Is there um, anything, any questions or anything, or I can turn it over to Lindy and she can, she can finish it up and you can ask your questions. Lindy will go ahead and have you present. And if you're thinking of questions or typing them in the chat, just go ahead and shoot them in there and we'll bring them up after the next presentation. Well, thanks you guys so much for having me today. Um, my name is Lindy Karchner and I am the Trauma Outreach and Education Coordinator for Primary Children's. Um, hold on, so close. So I'm really excited to be here with you today. Are you guys able to see my presentation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that looks good. Yes. OK, great. So I titled this Peds and Water Oh My because I think anytime you mix kids with water, there's a chance to be surprised. Um, I'm so grateful for Audrey and Mikkel and Carly for all presenting um, aspects of drowning and what we can do in our communities as well as far as water safety. Um, I kind of went the other route of what happens if you have a patient that has had a non-fatal drowning um, situation and they end up in your facility. So I split this up in, a, in four different sections. So um, number one, um, we're going to talk about PEDS anatomy. It's always good to review because kids are so different than um, taking care of adults. Um, the next part, we're going to have case studies because I love being able to apply our knowledge to real life situations. So I have two case studies for you guys. And then just a really quick wrap up um, when we talk about that. Um, I, love, I love talking about this because unfortunately kids, um, they're different than you and I. So if <laughs> you see my cute little boy here, um, kids, Pediatrics are growing and changing constantly. And so with that growing and changing, they get some unique um, aspects to their body. Um, the number one thing I always think about with kids is that they have giant heads. <laughs> and while sometimes that's just a visual reminder to you that they're growing and changing in trauma and in the medical world, um, it can cause different complications from meaning that when they have a trauma, they lead with their head because they're top heavy. When they fall, that's their head is falling first. Um, their airways are different just because of these giant heads. Um, so when we talk about their nose and their airway, their airways are small and floppy and they're positional with this big head. Um, the other thing is they have an underdeveloped nose. It's just slowly growing. It's a little on the cartilaginous, like floppy side. So unfortunately, because of these um, nose and airway with the big head, um, it predisposes our kids to drowning in a very small amount of water. Um, another fun aspect is their little weak necks. Um, they're trying to support these giant heads and they have weak neck lip muscles. So again, that causes problems with their airway, that causes problems with trauma because they're leading with their head. And so unlike our adult colleagues, our kids see a lot more um, soft tissue injuries with muscular problems than they do like C-spine injuries. Um, they have very small torsos. And while that looks really cute to like the average person, what it does in trauma is it complicates things because while you may have an impact on one part of the body, unfortunately it's transmitted throughout their entire torso. And so they have a very high chance of having multi-organ um, injuries with just a small impact. Um, the other thing is that they have soft pliable bones. So, 
again, they're growing and changing. Their bones haven't completely developed. But again, what that means is that if they have a trauma, that a lot of times they don't break that bone, but that energy is then transferred to any underlying tissues. And the last big thing I like to talk about is their high body surface area. Um, they just have a lot of skin showing. So they have high me metabolic rates. They have a lot of skin showing. So if our kids get cold or if they get sick or if they get wet and they're cold, um, they're, they have a tendency to get hypothermic a lot easier than adults. Okay, that was a quick review. Are you guys still with me? Okay, <laughs> we'll jump right into um, this first case study. Um, the thing I like to think about with these case studies is that trauma, like the one thing I hope you walk away with today is that trauma is trauma. Um, whether it's a kid or an adult, whether your child is one or a hundred years old, your patient's a hundred years old, um, we're going to be providing care for a patient exactly the same way. Um, trauma, unfortunately, um, when you think about water and kids, pools, anything like that, you introduce a lot of um, safety risks, right? Um, you have wet floors, kids like to run, kids like to play, kids like to do all kinds of different things. So in our first case study, mom brings Bob to the ED. Four-year-old Bob was climbing, was at grandma's house today. He was climbing up the ladder to the pool slide when he fell seven feet onto concrete. Mom says she watched him all afternoon um, and he's now sleepy and he's vomited four times. She was worried, so she brought him to you. <laughs> what do you do? Where do you even start with this patient? Um, they're probably okay, right? Who knows? Um, but again, when we talk about trauma, we're talking about that systematic approach. We want you guys to look at every patient exactly the same way. Um, whether you're ATCN, ATLS trained, or whether um, you're TNCC trained, every type of training for trauma goes through a systematic approach. So that's what we're going to apply is our systematic approach. Don't freak out. It's okay. It might be a kid, but you can do this. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and start with trauma is trauma, guys. It doesn't matter that our kid is four years old. We're going to continue to start with our systematic approach. So talk about his primary survey. When you look him over, you notice that your patient arouses with stimuli um, and then he vomits. His breath sounds are regular. His skin is pale, cool. Pulses are weak and a little tacky at 155. Um, he returns to sleep without stimuli and you calculate his GCS at 13. When you expose, you notice that there's no obvious trauma. So you've done your primary survey, right? <laughs> so what do we do? Is there anything, when you look at this, if you were from a nurse standpoint, from a caregiver standpoint, what red flags do you see and what should we do about them? Da, 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 da. Kidding. Well, he's, I won't he's really vomiting. Uh, he's vomiting, he's tachycardic and pale and cool um, without any obvious trauma. I worry about a head injury in this kiddo. Oh, you nailed it on the head, right? Because you have a pediatric patient who tried to climb up a slippery pool slide, right? Fell to concrete, right? There's your mechanism of injury. So pediatrics lead with their heads. So chances are head hit first onto concrete, right? Mom thought he would be okay, but now he's showing sign that he's not okay, right? So I love what you said. Um, so in our primary survey, do we need to suction his airway or is his airway patent? Again, that'll be something you'll do with your assessment. Um, think about oxygen, right? We always support breathing, especially in our traumatic patients. He's still a trauma patient. So we need to think about IV access. One IV, two IVs. And if you're thinking about IV access, when you mentioned that he was pale, tacky, had thready pulses, we should probably think about some support. Um, whether you use NS or LR at your facility, doesn't matter. But what we really want to um, stress is that 
that fluid is also warm. So we're not talking about a slow controlled rate here. We're talking about a rapid rate to support this patient. And when we're doing that, we would like that to be warm so we don't cause more problems. Um, your patient has an altered GCS. So when you're thinking about um, your disability, what about his pupils? So his pupils are normal. They're equal round reactive. What about his glucose? So pediatrics, this is another common thing, altered GCS, always check a glucose. Um, kids have that high metabolic rate, that high metabolic rate, and he's been vomiting, right? So he's lost a lot of that. So we have to think, is his glucose normal? Um, is that the reason that he's um, altered? Is it because of the head injury? Just more things that we're going to add to our um, assessment piece. And again, like you said, he probably had a head injury. So let's think about a head CT. Um, and we're gonna warm up our child. The easiest way, of course, warm blanket, it's nice and warm, it feels like a hug, kids love warm blankets. So if we complete our primary survey and we've intervened, we're gonna move on. What are we gonna move on to? Dun, 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 secondary survey, right? So this is really easy for him because we're gonna do this head to toe. And what we notice is probably what you've already suspected, right? And it's already been talked about. He has a head injury. There's bogginess to his right parietal area, um, but no other trauma. My, oh, here we go. His head CT shows a non-depressed parietal skull fracture. And I took this from a real patient and a real patient story. So this is actually the skull fracture that this patient had after falling seven feet. And you can see how extensive this is. And when we talk about kids, remember what I said about their bony, their bones? You have a high impact point. So unfortunately, our little friend Bob also had a six millimeter epidural hemorrhage. Um, so this patient, of course, oh, yeah, hopefully you guys can see this off to the side. So again, the CTs are flipped and so in the radiology world. And so even though this is his right side, this is also his right side that's on the left side. You can see this spot here where the um, blood collection is. And then you can see the soft tissue as well. Um, so we know our patient's abnormal. We know that he may be in a critical state at this point. He's had an altered GCS. He has a significant injury. What's important to realize is that although he has this collection of blood, it's not causing a mass effect on his midline. So his brain is actually accommodating this okay right now. Um, and so Bob, the trauma team decides to admit him. Um, this child did so well. Um, he didn't, he had a repeat head CT in the morning um, that showed his epidural was stable. It didn't require evacuation and he got to go home. So not every trauma patient or pool drowning anything ends up like this. But there are other injuries that can happen because of what your children are doing around pools. So keep that in mind, okay? Questions about this one before I move on to case study two. Okay, so case study number two. Remember, trauma is trauma. Um, EMS is en route with a two-year-old female. She was found in the community pool unresponsive. EMS reports that CPR is in progress. Um, they have placed an OPA and they are providing respirations by a valve back mask. Um, they placed an IO, they're giving epi, and they are pushing NS. Do you ever get this way <laughs> when you're like, you hear the story and you think, no, thank you. Go, go somewhere else. I don't, I don't think this was the right day for me. Um, I'll come back later <laughs> when you're trying to find that adult to kind of take care of the situation instead of doing it. But again, guys, it's going to be okay because trauma is trauma, right? We're going to take care of this patient just like we would take care of any other patient and we're gonna apply that systematic approach, okay? So our primary survey. Um, on initial exam, your ET tube is patent. EMS, 
EMS reports that they intubated en route. Um, breast allergens are assisted via your ET tube, and you notice that the left sound or the left side is diminished. This patient has pale, cool skin. There's no pulse when CPR, when there's a pulse check and CPR continues. There is no response. Your patient has a GCS of 3T. Is everyone familiar with T, with the um, extra words behind, or the extra letters behind the GCS? No. Okay, so um, we use either S, T, or P to describe whether the eyes are swollen, there's a tube in place, or the patient is paralyzed to basically explain why they would have an altered GCS. So um, this patient, again, we're saying they have a 3T, so their um, verbal response is probably altered because of an intubation. Of course, it's bigger than that, but <laughs> it's a way to document our assessment pieces. Um, you also note that the patient has fixed and dilated pupils. Um, when you expose this patient, there's no obvious trauma. So, oh, I didn't, sorry guys. This didn't come up happy and pretty like the other ones did. <laughs> um, when you look at a, um, an ET tube that was placed prior to arrival, um, you need to assess that, right? Um, is it patent? Is it in the right place? Um, what's really common with kids is that they have a very short airway. And so unfortunately, ET tubes can become displaced. They can also become pushed too far to the wrong side. Um, so how do you evaluate your ET tubes? Is it common for you guys to do um, blood gases, presence of end tidal CO2, um, presence of breast sounds, a chest X-ray? Um, these are some of the things that I think about when I think about evaluating um, the placement of a definitive airway. Um, in this patient, um, oh, there we go. In this patient, um, we do have this pre-existing entitled C or ET tube, sorry. And so you perform, let's see if it comes up here. No, oh, hold on. Okay, so we go ahead and we perform um, a blood gas. Um, we do a chest X-ray. And unfortunately, your patient, um, your patient's um, ET tube is too low. It has been advanced into the right main stem bronchus. Um, and so the number one cause of arrest in kids is respiratory. So despite the fact that this kid um, has this drowning event, you always have to think about respiratory and whether your respiratory status or ventilation is being properly um, managed um, and maintained. So what we find is our, our tube is too far in, it's only in the right side, you reposition that and you get a blood gas. And unfortunately, this patient's first blood gas is 6.6 .6 pH, their CO2 is 130, um, bicarb is 13 and potassium is seven. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Are we looking good? Or are we looking bad? <laughs> yeah, that's, that doesn't even take any like real like lab parameters to know that we are not doing good at this point, right? Um, so we're gonna reposition the tube. We're going to provide adequate support, adequate ventilation to this patient, okay? Um, I apologize. My computer wouldn't let me, it wouldn't let me download this chest x-ray and I was very sad about it, but you'll just have to imagine in your mind how ugly it looked. Um, when you reassess this patient after um, the chest x-ray and after the tube has been repositioned, you notice that you have bilateral diminished breast sounds. Normal? Abnormal? Are we worried? Is this suspected findings? Thumbs up, thumbs down. So I see this as an improvement in breast sounds after you've repositioned. I think it's a good um, clinical piece to think about where have your patient been? What have they been doing? Um, and is there other causes to have diminished breast sounds where you're still getting good adequate rise and fall? We're good there. Um, this, is a, this is a significant finding for your patient because they probably have water in their lungs as well. 
Um, dope will always be your friend when you're evaluating your tubes. And so always think about the different steps of dope, displacement, obstruction, pneumothorax, or is it your equipment, right? Um, CPR continues. It's now been 45 minutes um, since your patient has had um, CPR. There's now been 10 rounds of epi. How do you intervene here? So again, we're thinking about that systematic approach. If this is our trauma patient, how many lines does our trauma patient need? Ten? Cindy, in the chat, we've got an ECMO question mark, H's and T's. Oh, I love all of these thoughts. So um, I love the idea of H's and T's because when you get to this point in your primary survey, you're always thinking about, um, you always switch to PALS when your patient arrests. Right. And so we're in an asystole PALS algorithm. And so ACES or H's and T's are our only reversible causes at this point. Um, so again, we have helped with our acidemia, like we're trying to intervene in all of these other ways, right? Um, and when you think about ECMO, that's a really interesting thought. We have some very specific criteria at primary children's. Um, a patient has to arrest inside the hospital to be. Um, to be a candidate for um, ECMO. If it's a traumatic ECMO, it's usually for a cold water drowning situation. We like, the patient has to be hypothermic and we're looking at like 32 degrees. So we're looking at a very specific clinical criteria. Um, the other thing is how high this patient's potassium is right now. So potassium of seven is, doesn't have good clinical outcomes even if they go on ECMO. So I really appreciate that, that's a great thought. Um, and before you would get to that point, of course, we're thinking about our circulation, right? And H's and T's, and this patient needs another access point. Um, this is a really good um, time to think about, when do you skip two pokes for a PEDS patient? This is the situation. You have active CPR in progress. It's time to skip to the, absolute definitive um, access point of an IO. So you have one in place, you need a second. Um, and again, you can do, when you're thinking about sites for peds, it's always proximal tip. We then go to distal femur. Um, there's really bad literature about humeral heads in pediatrics and whether it depends on size of patient as far as weight or whether it's development. Um, so it's really hard to determine whether a humeral head would be a good choice for a pediatric patient. And so I would use your clinical judgment. If you've used both, if you've used bilateral proximal tips, if you've used distal femurs, your last chance is, um, is your humeral head. Um, so thank you for those comments. Any other questions that I, had? I can't see the chat, Ali, sorry. We have a couple questions from case study one that came um, a little bit later, okay. but I'll read those to you when you're done with this case study. Okay, sounds great. Um, so CPR is in progress. Thank you again for mentioning H's and T's. Um, our GCS is 3T. So again, we have an altered GCS. Another one of those H's and T's is hypoglycemia, right? So do we need to look at um, a glucose? Yes, the answer is always yes. Um, and then our patient is, of course, um, needing to be warmed. In pediatric arrests, um, it's very facility dependent whether they do um, controlled hypothermia at like 36 degrees or whether you're looking at normal thermia. PALS will tell you that normal thermia is always a good idea. Hyper is not okay. So we're shooting for a happy temperature, nothing below, nothing above. Um, and again, if you don't get to that point and the ICU then decides to do a little bit of cooling method for like the prescribed five days, again, that's up to them. Okay, so when we're thinking about trauma as trauma, we're on our primary survey. Do we ever get to move past our primary survey in our current state? Thumbs up? Thumbs down? No, I love it. Oh. Sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to get some kind of reaction. I love, uh, I, I can only see like five of your faces. 
So it's really great to see all these like, no idiot, like <laughs> we're, we're stuck right here. We're like circling here. Um, kids are pretty remarkable because you are correct. We are not gonna move on to our secondary survey because we have significant red flags and our patient is not stable in our primary survey. Um, this might be a time to start thinking about stopping our resuscitation. Our patient has had prolonged CPR. They had, I apologize, I didn't tell you this, but um, when EMS arrives, they also told you that family had been at the pool for an hour. Um, the little brother walked up to mom and said, or this patient's too, the four-year-old brother is the one that walked up to mom and said, hey, sister's drowning. So unfortunately, like we talked about earlier with with um, water safety. This mom didn't know where this child was or didn't have eyes on the child. So there's an unknown downtime, but it could possibly be up to an hour before the patient was found. And now it's been 45 minutes of CPR with 10 rounds of epi. So our providers choose to um, working, keep working through the H's and T's. And as they're working through these H's and T's, they actually achieve ROSC in this patient. It did take 50 minutes of CPR and 12 rounds of epi. Um, so this patient gets a quick primary survey or a secondary survey and there's no signs of trauma. I don't know about you guys, but I think as a medical provider, it's one of the hardest things for me to see this type of um, situation and there hasn't been a traumatic accident or something else that occurred in conjunction. So again, our trauma patient, we decide to go ahead and get a head CT. Unfortunately, um, with our suspicions and with our prolonged um, CPR and what it took to resuscitate this patient, this patient has a diffuse cerebral edema and um, the radiologist mentions that this is consistent with an acute hypoxic ischemic injury. So I really appreciated Mikhail mentioning about the anoxic injuries because unfortunately, once um, this has occurred, there's nothing we can do about this. So this patient is admitted to the ICU. Um, the ICU provides post-arrest care, um, but there's progression of the cerebral edema and this patient does succumb to her injuries. So why, <laughs> why would I even mention this case? Why would I bring up the worst of the worst where you have now, I mean, if you're that nurse, you've been with this for 35 years, active CPR. This is a stressful event. Family may or may not be present. You may have like a mom wailing in the hallways. Why my child, why my child? Or um, something like that. Um, this case may be triggering some of your feelings. Have you recently had a past pediatric um, resuscitation? Have you, um, maybe this patient looks like your child. I had that happen. And I just have to say that even to this day, I can remember, I can remember my emotion as a seasoned trauma nurse, seeing this child wheel in unresponsive that looked identical to my child. And it took my breath away. And like I said, even to this day, I feel myself tearing up because of the emotions I felt at that moment. And I still, I still carry them even though I've tried to get rid of these. So I mentioned this case and I specifically chose the prior case because unfortunately, trauma is trauma. We can do what we can on our medical end, but prevention, is where it's at. And the what ifs will kill you in these situations as far as a medical professional. And why didn't that mom watch that patient? Why didn't that, why was the brother in charge of the child? Why, I mean, the what ifs will always, um, will always spiral, right? But I think understanding that we have limitations as medical providers is what I hope you realized. And that in these moments, when you have a negative outcome, you have to own your piece of the puzzle and you can't own the entire thing. You were not in charge of the patient at the pool. You weren't the EMS providers. You weren't the poor lifeguards who responded to this patient, right? You weren't any of those people. So like 
understanding your limitations and acknowledging them and making sure that you're okay after a patient like this. That's it. Okay, bring on the questions. Thank you so much, Lindy and Carly. I'm first going to um, launch the post-session polling for anyone who needs to get out of here right at 1230. Um, but we did have a few questions. So first, I wanted to go back to Janet's question about the child in case number one. And she was just clarifying that they didn't need to go to the OR for evacuation. So I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about that first. Yeah, so this is, I think this is pretty specific to pediatric patients. Um, I think medicine in general is trying to always walk that fine line of what is okay, when do I need to intervene and when am I causing more harm, right? So this is something that we've seen more frequently. Um, and I know Dr. Pruitt's on the line, I bet he could speak better to this, but um, an epidural that is stable, um, that is not causing, so when I say stable, that means it's not growing, it's not causing a mass effect on that midline. So your brain is tolerating it well. Um, that also means that your circulation has to be tolerating it well as well. So strong pulses, um, strong blood pressures, um, and besides that, good cap refill. So we're really looking at like perfusing the body and making sure it's okay, um, despite this head injury. So if your patient, um, if this patient woke up the next morning, wasn't tolerating clears, continued to vomit, had an increasing um, epidural instead of with that six millimeter size, my guess is neurosurgery would have intervened and evacuated this epidural. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and we also had some discussion in the chat too about um, when to start swim lessons. So how effective are they for the one to three-year-old range? And um, talking a little bit more about that less than one-year-old range for swim lessons as well. So I don't know who would be best to Mikhail, kind of address yeah. this, but maybe Mikel or Audrey. Audrey. Yeah, I can address it. I kind of did in the chat as well, but um, I think, um, and I think what they were bringing up was ISR self-rescue lessons. And those are great options if you're the right type of parent and family. Um, they're pretty expensive. Uh, they do offer a few scholarships, but the other part is they are very much like a, a training. And so the child doesn't have a good, fun experience swimming at the pool. It's a, it's a training. Um, and it depends on the kid. A lot of kids grow into that and learn to love swimming through that process. Um, and some kids shy away from it because they don't love the process. So it just depends on you as a parent and if that's a good option for your family. Um, but I think the most effective thing to do is to get your kids in lessons early. You may not take five or six lessons in a row at one or three years old. You're just introducing them to the water, teaching them how to be safe, wait for a parent, wear a life jacket. And a lot of what we're doing in those lessons is educating parents on watching their kids when they're in the water, having a water watcher, um, making sure their kids are in a life jacket around open water, things like that. Um, so through those parent-child lessons, there's the typical... Uh, format for the, for that age group. And then I haven't seen, and Audrey can jump in on this, um, as far as kids actually learning strokes and being able to be comfortable in the water, you see floating um, and some doggy paddling around age four. And then after that, about six. So anywhere between five and six years old, you can get kids to really start swimming and putting in um, distance, if that makes sense. So that's my opinion on swim lessons. I ditto everything she says, but I also would add that every child is different. And so what you see with, you know, there might be a four-year-old that's just like can swim on their back and you might see a seven-year-old that doesn't want to even put their face in the water. So I think you always need to err on the side of like the child's personality and we don't ever want them to be afraid of the water. We want them to be smart and safer. And so that goes back to like, always ask someone before you get in water, make sure you tell an adult, but we don't want them, if they are screaming all the time, no matter how old they are, give them a break <laughs> from swim lessons. Thank you. And then Kathleen mentioned in the chat that they did um, Red Cross Mommy and Me swim lessons when her kids were young. Parent talk classes are awesome. Any last minute questions before we um, end the session today? 
Hey, can I just say one more thing? We really want to just be involved in, you know, anything that we can be. We don't want to make more work for anybody. We just want to support. So for primary children, they've already got that on their website. We would love to share that on ours. And we would love to have a link to our website on any website. We just, we're going to go to the Safe Kids Fair. We want to be present and take advantage of any opportunity to help educate parents and children on how they can be safer around and in water, all bodies of water. So if you have any places we can go or people we can talk to, let us know. I feel like Carly and I would probably jump right there with you. We would be more than happy to talk to anybody about how you would prevent an injury than actually have to care for the child or deal with the devastation after the fact. 